and welcome to The Point World Affairs. I'm Tae sang -mi. The European Union has recently floated the idea of fielding a common military force as it seeks to lessen its reliance on the U.S. security umbrella in response to President Trump's isolationist foreign policy. As we mark the 100th year since the end of World War I, we'll be taking a closer look at how this proposal came about and the subsequent reactions from the international community. For that, we have with us Dr. Ko myung -yun, a research fellow from the Asan Institute for Policy Studies. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Before we get into the discussion, let's first take a look at this short clip. On November 6, French President Emmanuel Macron called for the creation of a common EU military to allow the European Union to defend itself without the need of outside intervention. On November 13, German Chancellor Angela Merkel backed President Macron's proposal during her speech at the European Parliament. Fortschritte bei der strukturierten Zusammenarbeit im militärischen Bereich erreicht. Das ist gut und wird ja auch hier weitestgehend unterstützt. Aber wir sollten, das sage ich sehr bewusst auch aus der Entwicklung der letzten Jahre, wir sollten an der Vision arbeiten, eines Tages auch eine echte europäische Armee zu schaffen. This represents a sharp U-turn in Germany's stance in fielding a joint EU military, with the country having been long reluctant in regards to its creation. Chancellor Merkel emphasized that a common EU armed forces could complement the U.S.-led NATO security alliance instead of undermining it. NATO is the main security guarantor for many European countries, led by the United States. However, the alliance is being sternly tested with the election of President Donald Trump, who has pressured his European allies to shoulder a bigger portion of its defense cost burden. Trump also appeared to lend his support for Italy, which supported Brexit and has frequently clashed with the European Union since the formation of a populist far-right coalition government in Rome. This has seemingly created a growing rift between the United States and the European Union, led by its two major powers, France and Germany, which have joined efforts to create a common EU military. The proposal to create a common European armed forces has laid bare, mounting tensions between the United States and the European Union since the election of President Donald Trump. In this week's edition of The Point World Affairs, we take a closer look at the possible formation of a joint EU military and its impact on the global security climate, as well as the long-standing military alliance between the United States and Europe. Dr. Go, this is not the first time the European Union has talked about this uh, formation of a joint EU military. So why is discussion, why is this issue being raised multiple times in a series of manners? Well, I think it's a reflection of uh, the recent events in the light of uh, what happened uh, in Libya in uh, uh, with the Arab Spring, uh, with the subsequent refugee crisis and the, cri the civil war ongoing in Syria, and as well as the conflict with Russia in Ukraine. And I think has precipitated uh, a lot of serious crisis, which undermined the sense of security in Europe, especially when uh, President Donald Trump uh, has actually criticized the U.S. allies in Europe for not really bearing the, its own share of the defense burden. So has criticized NATO, which is the fundamental collective security architecture that exists in Europe to defend the European countries against external threats. So I think uh, this multiple series of events has actually uh, raised the need to come up with a more permanent uh, security structure uh, for the Europeans and by the Europeans, which could, could come across as a replacement of the existing American provider security architecture called NATO. So I think uh, this is, I mean, I think a more of a response to the ongoing uh, uh, foreign policy and national security crisis that surrounds Europe right now. And this is the French idea. President mm. Macron, he has come up with this mm. proposal of uh, forming this uh, mm. military. And it, it seems like it has garnered uh, mm. support from the German mm. Chancellor Angela Merkel. So considering that Germany is an, it was an aggressor in mm. the World War II mm. and its powerful influence within the European Union, I think it's quite important. 
What's your thought on that? Well, uh, it's, it's true that the French President uh, Emmanuel Macron floated this idea about joint European uh, Defense Force. But then I think the, the underlying idea as a policy framework has existed for a long time. Actually, it was first mentioned back in 2009 with the Treaty, the treaty of Lisbon, which expanded the European Union and also deepened the level of integration among the European Union members. Last year, actually, in September 2017, uh, 2028, actually, European member states, uh, which is soon going to be 27, with the, with the departure of the uh, United Kingdom uh, next March because of Brexit, uh, all the members of the European Union agreed to set up a common uh, security policy framework called PESCO, which is an abbreviation of the Permanent uh, Structure Corporation. So this is actually a policy framework to conduce it for a, a European-wide defense policy. And it's, it, within this framework, uh, the European member states already uh, floated this idea of creating a joint European army in the near future, if it's possible. So the European Union member states have been working together for a long time to create, first, a common defense framework, and second, a unified uh, armed forces. So what the French president has mentioned is not really, uh, didn't really come out, out of blue. Actually, it's a reflection of an ongoing process, which is deepening the integration of uh, European Union member states, not just in the, in the uh, economic area or political arena, but also in the defense area, uh, domain. So you're saying this is not a brand new idea that has just come up. It has been there for a long period exactly. of time. Okay, let's uh, hear more about hmm. that from our experts. On November 11th, world leaders gathered in Paris to mark the centennial anniversary of the end of World War I. The leaders reminded the audience that World War I, which took the lives of more than 10 million people, was triggered by fervent nationalism. Dieser Krieg mit seinem sinnlosen Blutvergießen zeigt, wohin nationale Selbstherrlichkeit und militärische Überheblichkeit führen können. Und er macht bewusst, welche verheerenden Folgen Sprachlosigkeit und Kompromisslosigkeit in Politik und Diplomatie haben können. French President Emmanuel Macron in particular seemingly took aim at President Donald Trump's American First policy and its role in spreading nationalism across the globe. Et il y a 100 ans, nos prédécesseurs ont tenté de construire durablement cette paix. Ils ont inventé la Société des Nations, la première forme de coopération internationale, mais elle s'est fracassée sur l'unilatéralisme de certains, sur les crises économiques, morales et les nationalismes. President Trump expressed his displeasure over Macron's remarks on Twitter following his return to the United States. Trump accused Macron of a Trump heading the creation of a common EU military merely to provide a distraction from his falling popularity and high unemployment at home, adding that it was Germany which had started both world wars. The French government didn't react kindly to Trump's remarks on Twitter, saying that his tweet was uploaded on the three-year anniversary of the Paris terror attacks, which took the lives of 130 people. Sur ces tweets, hier c'était le 13 novembre. Nous commémorions l'assassinat de 130 de nos compatriotes il y a trois ans à Paris. Donc je vais répondre en anglais. Common decency aurait été bon alors. This marks a new low in the relationship with Presidents Trump and Macron just seven months after their summit in April, where they appear to be getting along well. The leaders of Europe and the United States are continuing to butt heads over a number of contentious economic and political issues, with France, Germany and the U.S. at the forefront of this conflict. We'll be getting some expert analyses on where each of these countries stand and how their relations will take shape in the coming months in the midst of the controversy over the formation of a common EU military. Let's now connect live to an expert from France and joining us is Frédéric Charlie Long, a professor of international relations at the University of Clermont. Welcome, Professor. Morning. Hello. Thank you very much. Are you in favor of French President Emmanuel Macron's proposal to field a joint EU military? If so, what are your reasons? The will of, of President Macron to uh, develop uh, the European project in general has been very clearly stated very, very quickly, um, even is in his presidential campaign, even before being elected. Uh, since he has been elected, 
Uh, his will is to forge a new, to create, to build a new uh, European Union, because obviously there are problems. Um, people in Europe are not satisfied with Europe as such, uh, not satisfied with the European Union as, as a, a kind of political um, creation. So um, there is a reflection on uh, what to do to make Europe more protective uh, and more efficient. Well, one of the, of the tracks, one of the solutions, one of the possibilities is clearly to make Europe uh, a real strategic actor on the world stage so that Europe can, of course, protect peace and democracy in the world, but protect its own citizens. And, uh, of course, we need to, to, to move forward uh, in terms of defense and foreign policy. We, we know we have a problem with that. Uh, the project dates back from the, the early 90s. What have we seen since the early 90s? Not much. Europe was not really able to handle um, the problem and the war in the Balkans, which is next door for uh, for Europe. Uh, Europe was not able to play a real role in the Middle East. So th there is a clear uh, will today to, to, to build this uh, this new tool, this new military and diplomatic tool. It's not easy. Thank you for your time today, Professor Sharon Lon. Let's now connect to an expert in Germany to get some of her thoughts. And joining us is Dr. Claudia Major, Senior Associate at the International Security Division at German Institute for International and Security Affairs. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. In your view, what are Chancellor Merkel's reasons for supporting President Macron's proposal for a joint EU military? Do you believe it's in response to the growing pressure that President Trump is applying on Europe, both politically and economically? I think, first of all, it's important to underline that the idea of a European army or closer European military cooperation is very old. So that's not new. It came up in the 50s and then came back again and again. So it's an old idea that resurfaces regularly. Um, I think the, there are two reasons why it comes back right now. And the first reason is that um, in France and to some extent also in Germany, there is a conviction that Europeans should be able to take more responsibility for Europe. The idea behind this is to say Europeans developed with the European Union a really remarkable, impressive political construct. So Europeans cooperate very closely from agriculture up to finances and trade, but security and defense is organized within NATO and the US. So it seems to be a little bit odd to say we cooperate on every issue, but not on defense, so should not make the last step in defense. That is one reason. And the other reason is obviously, as you already mentioned, the changing transatlantic relationship. This started for US President Trump, it's likely to continue afterwards, but the very, I would say, unconventional way of doing politics by the current US President certainly gives the impression to the Europeans that things have changed. So there is the idea in Europe that the transatlantic relationship has substantially, structurally changed. We don't agree on many issues like the Iran deal or climate change, and on other issues. So there's the idea or the impression in Europe that this relationship is changing and we might need to stand a bit more on our own feet because we don't know how this transatlantic relationship is going to develop and whether the US will always be a reliable Many commentators, including Dr. Goh here, is saying that uh, Europe is now facing a lot of challenges uh, compared to the past, including the standoffs with the United States and uh, also a lot of um, issues inside the continent, such as the rise of the far right. So would you, do you think that this formation of this military would actually help mitigate these kind of risks? I think, first of all, it's really important to underline that this idea of a European army is very much a political concept. It's a very lofty political concept. Um, there's not much talk about how would it, what it would mean in terms of implementation, what it would really require the states to do. So it's very much a political idea in the moment, not really practical. And the other thing is uh, it's important to, to um, remind us that we have a lot of military cooperation already in Europe. So the states European states cooperate in, in smaller formats, like the Germans and the Dutch or the Nordic countries. So we have many islands of cooperation. The question is whether states actually succeed in 
bringing that together on the European level. And here I see indeed a problem because some countries like, for example, Poland, fear that a too close European cooperation or focus on European cooperation might actually damage or weaken the link to the US. And they fear very much that that would damage considerably the transatlantic relationship in defense. Personally, I tend to think that that's not really a challenge because the US has always been calling for greater burden sharing. So the Europeans should do more on defense. And if the Europeans would do more for defense, NATO and the transatlantic relationship would benefit. But there is indeed the risk of a division, of a fragmentation, if European countries don't agree on what to do. And this risk is indeed here. Thank you. That was Dr. Claudia Major from Berlin. So, Dr. Goh, what do you think about the analysis from our European experts, uh, especially uh, Dr. Claudia just mentioned um, about um, how this um, close relationship or getting closer, European countries getting closer, can actually harm the transatlantic relationship, especially with the United States. What's your thought on that? I think uh, the two European experts have outlined uh, very well two competing uh, elements here when it comes to competing dilemmas, I would say, when it comes to creating a joint European armed forces. Uh, one is the, I mean, on the upside would be gaining strategic autonomy from the United States when it comes to conducting its own security policies by the Europeans. But another like down, the potential downside would be the weakening of the transatlantic relations, which uh, refers to the military, I mean, security alliance between Europe and the United States. So this could be, could be seen as a mutually exclusive, and that's something that uh, that President uh, Trump has pointed out that a creation of a European army would actually uh, lessen the need uh, for the transatlantic alliance. Uh, Dr. Major has pointed out, I think uh, she's correct in the sense that uh, uh, creation of a, a stronger uh, European defense force doesn't necessarily exclude the uh, United States from uh, the security architecture in Europe. I think this, these two are complementary. As she has pointed out, uh, it's, uh, I think it uh, remains to be seen whether the European Union will be able to succeed in creating uh, a viable uh, uh, un United Integrated uh, Defense Force in the near future. Another thing is that, uh, I mean, the French president, like I'm mentioning, the need for a European army at this particular moment, when the NATO itself is being criticized by no other than the US president, I think it could be a political maneuvering on the part of the French president to remind the United States that uh, if NATO falters, then Europe will go on its, own, on its own way, and that could only undermine the security interests of the United States. So it's a, in a way, it's a reminder to the uh, US, uh, United States that uh, you know, for a strong United States, it needs a strong Europe. Let's now get an opinion from an expert from the United States. And now joining us is Peter Kuznick, Professor of History and Director of the Nuclear Studies Institute at American University in Washington, D.C. Good to have you on, Professor. Uh, nice to be with you. The proposal for a common EU military came amidst the backdrop of President Trump's veiled threats to leave NATO, which has European leaders concerned that the existing NATO framework could be insufficient to adequately meet its security needs. The Europeans are very concerned about other things that Trump has been doing. They were very disturbed by the United States pulling out of the Iran nuclear deal. Trump recently said that he wants to pull the United States out of the INF Treaty, Intermediate or Nuclear Forces Treaty. So this is very concerning to the Europeans. In fact, the Europeans have gone so far as to try to develop alternative banking structures that can allow their companies to deal with Iran, to trade with Iran, despite U.S. insistence that they not do so, and the U.S. threat of sanctions. Trump is a very unstable partner to the Europeans now. He's also criticized Germany for its economic dealings with Russia. He said basically Russia owns Germany. Uh, he's been very hostile to uh, Macron recently. So with Trump as a partner, the Europeans are starting to say, well, maybe we need some alternative structure. Uh, but this is not something realistic, certainly not something realistic in the short run. Maybe over the long term, in decades, the Europeans can do something. But the Europe, they're not going to create an alternative structure to NATO now. They don't want to increase defense spending. Europe is much more pulling apart now than coming together. 
uh, especially with Brexit and some of the other recent developments, developments in Italy and other places. So the thought that Europe would develop a unified army. How do you think about this creation of the EU military? What kind of effect will there be on the United States and on the global security environment? The global security environment is very unstable right now. The only positive development we've seen on the world scene in the last year is the increasing friendship or a positive relationship developing between South Korea and North Korea. Everywhere else we're seeing dissolution. Uh, we see recently the United States was conducting and, and NATO was conducting the biggest war games in Norway since uh, 1991. The Russians just, just concluded Vostok 18, a massive war game in conjunction with China and Mongolia, the biggest war game that Russia's carried out since 1981. Japan has been carrying on very large-scale military exercises of its own. You look what's happening on the global scene. In January of this year, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientist moved the hands of the doomsday clock to two minutes before midnight. That's the closest we've been since the 1950s. We've got every nuclear power in the world modernizing its nuclear arsenal, making its weapons more usable. Uh, it's a, just a, the tension between the United States and China, with the U.S. conducting freedom of navigation operations. U.S. and Chinese warships came within 45 yards of each other recently. So the world is primed right now for a confrontation, something that can be quite very, very dangerous. Uh, so. Um, I, I see that the, the overall security situation on a global scene right now is the most dangerous, certainly since the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, and I'm fearful of what could develop either by accident or miscalculation, uh, misinterpretation. Uh, we've got to step back. We've got we need statesmanship, the kind of statesmanship that Moon Jae-in exhibited in reaching out to North Korea and diffusing some of the tensions there when it looked like war was imminent there uh, is the kind of statesmanship we need on a global scale. And nobody is providing it. Macron has appointed himself to play that role, but I don't think he's really very well suited for it. Thank you. That was Professor Peter Kuznick from Washington, D.C. Dr. Goh, do you want to add to Dr. Kuznick's uh, comments. He mentioned a lot of interesting things, especially about uh, the examples learned from the Korean Peninsula. Well, I pretty much agree with uh, Dr. Kastning in many, uh, many of the things that he said. But then uh, I, I would like to actually uh, I mean, comment on the, the fact that he, he thinks that the likelihood of a, a creation of a European army is actually a pipe dream, That's a, which is actually a low probability. Uh, I, I, I would like to disagree with that. I think there are, when it comes to security cooperation, there are many, many different areas. Not just there's like a classic domain of a military cooperation on uh, having a joint army, but then when it comes to security challenges, there are areas where you don't need to have a, a classic army. You actually have, can cooperate on the terrorism. You can uh, actually cooperate on the cyber, uh, cyber threats. So in that sense, I think that there are many issues, security issues that the European Union can handle without creating a joint army that they can, uh, uh, that they're facing right now. So I think uh, having a, very, a viable security cooperation is very possible. So how do you foresee this whole development will pan out, especially taking into consideration the Brexit process? Mm. Um, Clearly, I mean, the, the exit of the Great Britain from the European Union has really strengthened the voice among the European, some European states to gain more strategic autonomy from the United States or Russia. Uh, but at the same time, I would say that the uh, European Union is very like, uh, uh, realistic about the prospect of having, um, having a going alone in the security front, especially in the classic military front, in the form of having a classic like uh, traditional military units and, and so forth. I would say the European Union, as I mentioned before, is going to focus more on the uh, new challenges, new security challenges such as terrorism and cyber threats and also as a refugee crisis. These are areas that uh, you don't need to have a, a higher level of uh, military integration. You don't need to have a joint command structure or you don't, you don't need to have a, like, a high level of uh, advanced weapons. You, what you need is a policy coordination at the high level. And this is something that Europe has done a great job at. And they, they are very experienced in coordinating many different countries towards a common goal. 
they have done that already in the economic integration and, uh, and other like, security issues such as the uh, refugee crisis. So I think, uh, I think Europe is actually well prepared to handle some of the more non-traditional challenges that they face now. So I think we should look beyond the creation of European army. You should take the, the news of a creation of European army as a reflection of a creation of a common European defense policy. Okay, we'll keep close tabs on the developments mm. on the European continent. Thank you for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. This year marks the 100th anniversary since the end of World War I, but security uncertainties in Europe remain a concern over rising tensions between the United States and the European Union. It remains to be seen whether the 70-year-old NATO alliance will continue to be the cornerstone of the security in the region, or if it faces a risk of division within its own ranks. That's all we have for this week's The Point World Affairs. Thank you for tuning in and see you again next week.